So Amnon is a, uh, probably you may not know, but he has been one of the most successful entrepreneur that came out of uh, Israel. Hi, Amnon. Hello, hi. hi uh. I am so glad you can join us in a very difficult time as a friend, as a colleague, as a co-board member. I am just uh, happy that you are there safe and uh, being part of uh, this journey. But uh, I, I'm sure there's many things going in your mind right now. But if, despite all that, you are here. So let me give you an introduction to the group, and then we can have you give your perspective on it. So just so that some of you may not know Amnon, uh, Amnon has been a very persistent entrepreneur. Uh, I have known him for many years now. He worked on this idea of providing the eyes and the ears of a devices, especially automobiles, that can be able to provide a automated a, uh, driving possibilities. He is a professor in computer science and AI. That's his expertise. But he's applying that into applying in one of the biggest applications, which help us to drive better. So probably 80 or 90% of cars had their technology embedded using AI technologies and sensors. Uh, making the experience much better than it had been. It had one of the most successful um, IPO in Israel history, as well as the double, actually, IPO in the US, over $30 billion market cap today. So without too much information, what I'd like to do is have Amnon to talk about how did he start building his company over 20 years ago. So I'm going to tell you, it's not something that just happened overnight. It happened over a long time. And I want to get Amnon's view around what it took to build a, a company like he did in Israel, and what are the um, uh, investment climate is like over there, and uh, how things are going over here, given this circumstance. So Amnon, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Young. So, you know, the, the kind of question is, is you know, this 24-year-long uh, 20, uh, uh, journey, uh, what did we do? Uh, what did we do right in order to make Mobileye whatever Mobileye is? I'll open this light a bit. Okay. So now, just uh, as context, Mobileye market cap of Mobileye today is about thirty billion dollars. We have thirty five hundred employees. Annual revenue is about two billion dollars and uh, and growing. But if I kind of look at those twenty four years and try to isolate uh, key uh, key decisions that are all around bold innovation. You know, meaning trying to do something that others would advise you not to do. So for example, our first innovation decision was to double down on monocular uh, processing, uh, monocular processing for, uh, for computer vision where the industry and experts at the time were focused on stereo uh, processing. Today, all cars that have a driving assist, you know, the majority, 99% of those who have, you know, a camera doing driving assist, it's monocular uh, processing. Um, so uh, next we uh, doubled down on making our own system on chip, on our own silicon. That was back in 2001. So more than 20 years ago. Today, today there are many fabulous uh, companies, but you know, 20 years ago, being fabulous in the automotive industry was something uh, unheard of. You know, thinking that a startup can supply a, a silicon piece of silicon to a car maker was uh, was very bold, and and even some thought was was kind of uh, foolish. You know, uh, becoming a tier two supplier and working with all the tier one in a non-exclusive basis was also something uh, quite innovative uh, for the time. Now we we're also bold on the computer vision uh, features. You know, the industry wanted only lane departure warning. That's what they thought the camera is good for. All the rest would be done with the radar. Um, and and we, we gradually introduced forward collision warning on, on vehicles. Then we introduced a forward collision warning on pedestrians. Then we introduced uh, automatic braking on vehicles and, and, uh, pedest and pedestrians. Then we gradually removed the radar. You know, the majority of uh, entry-level ADAS today is only it's only camera. There's no there's no radar there, 
And then we ventured into autonomous uh, driving about a decade ago, and, and we did that also in an innovative way, rather than copycatting you know, the LIDAR-centric uh, companies that exist still today in this space. Mobileye took a, a very bold and innovative uh, approach on, on focusing first on, on cameras and then adding redundant sensors like uh, LADARs and, and, and radars. I think you know we made also you know key business uh, decisions you know were very innovative, uh, focusing on the bottom line. <clears throat> Since uh, 2014, the company is uh, profitable, and remained that way even during the five years under Intel. So creating a viable business is a key driver, not only you know developing a cool a cool stuff. And I think the advantage of you know coming out from Israel is a pool of very strong engineers you know it's a pool of a teams and you know the concentration of of uh, a teams here in israel is is uh, is very high and and you know building a tech company you know you really want you know the the, the best engineers that you can find and here there's a very high uh, concentration so um I, I think it's it's not a coincidence that you know mobili even though there's no automotive industry in israel uh, because Mo uh, Mobileye is a tech company, software company, you know, designing chips. But you no, know, at the end of the day, it's a software company. Um, now, this is really the sweet spot of uh, of Israel. So, uh, Amnon, I know uh, uh, working with a automobile companies, it's not an easy, right? It takes very long cycle, and of course, the managing the relationship where each of our two companies want their own unique architecture, unique solution, because they don't like to share. And yet today, 80 or 90% of all the cars have your technology. So it requires an incredible differentiation, innovation, as well as a business partnership that are, that are unique because you have captured much of their data to make your system better. And I'm just curious, how did you do that, given the difficulty of uh, managing each of the OEM relationship? I, I think that the, the, the key driver was to find a way to do a sublinear growth. Sublinear in terms of, you know, the more customers you have, you don't want to grow linearly with the number of employees or, or the amount of resources you want to spend. So for example, a, a tier one, grows linearly with the amount of customers. Each customer requires putting hundreds of uh, people, you know, near the, the customer's uh, site. And, and, and this, this causes scalability uh, issues. So one of the kind of, you know, innovative thinking that we had at the beginning is how to create something that can scale such that the amount of resources we need to put by entertaining new customers would grow sublinearly with the number of uh, of customers. So, for example, we have 3,500 employees today, but that's very, very small compared to the amount, the number of customers. We have more than 50 car makers uh, working with us. We have around 100 production programs running in parallel uh, every year. It's something that's very, very difficult to do with uh, 3,500 employees unless you build templates. And, and you build kind of tuning languages on top of those uh, templates such that the customer feels that they own the driving experience, but the underlying technology is, is really shared among, uh, among, all, uh, among all the programs. Mm -hmm. So this is something that we, we spent a lot of thought, how to, how to make that growth in a sublinear manner. So, you know, because I'm actually involved in the automobile industry as a chairman of Harman, the tier one means the uh, people that are adding integration for OEMs between the technology supplier, very difficult work. And I think what Amnon has done is really changed the paradigm by providing a, a platform with the customizable uh, layers, stacks, that, that can be able to meet OEMs' need. Now, a lot of people are uh, you know, excited about this idea of autonomous driving uh, particularly Elon Musk has promised uh, that in, I think, 2019, it's not here yet. So the question I think is probably in the room, where are we going with autonomous driving? Do you see that coming soon, or do you see that as a, uh, something that's going to take time? No, it, it, I'm, I'm very optimistic. And, and you need to define what, what you mean by autonomous uh, driving. There, there, there are two main industries for autonomous driving. One of them 
is what most people are aware of is robo taxis. What Waymo is doing, uh, Cruise, uh, in which you uh, are replacing the driver in a mobility as a service. You're replacing the driver with a robotic uh, driver. From a technology point of view, no, I, I, I think there, there are no open open issues there. It's just a matter of how to scale the business. And and uh, you see those companies that are building uh, robo taxis, they, they burn billions of dollars every year. And, and the challenge is how to scale this business and become uh, profitable. The second you know, industry of autonomous driving is, is just you know, is just forming now, which is uh, consumer cars. So um, imagine, you know, you buy a car and you have an eyes off, hands off, eyes off uh, system there with a uh, certain operational design domain in ODD, for example, just highways. Once you're on a highway, you can legally have an eyes off. You, you can, you know, read a book or, or something like that. And uh, once uh, it, it gets off the highway to an urban area, it will ask you to take over. And if you don't take over, it will, you know, stop on the side. These things are now already being, being sourced. So by 2026, a number of car makers, we announced already three or four car makers that we are going to supply this uh, technology, are going to introduce these, uh, these uh, systems starting on highways and then later adding more types of roads like arterial roads and urban. So autonomous driving, or let's say eyes off system, hands off, eyes off uh, system, we're going to see them in volume during this decade, whether robo taxis or consumer AVs. This decade is the decade of uh, of deployment of these uh, of, of these systems. Great. I'm, I'm sure uh, I already drove in one of your cars when I was visiting you last May. Uh, some real excitement in some of the technology advancement that are going on. Uh, I'm sure we'll continue to see that evolving. Now, last question for you, because I know it's late in Israel, but I do appreciate you joining. Uh, clearly, we are in the top of uh, excitement around AI topics. And given your background and you're one of the pioneers, really using not only invent, you know, involved in developing, but also applying and, and, and actually taking the market uh, of these AI technology products. Tell us where are we with where we are today and how do you see it going? Well, when you look at the large language models, <clears throat> the type of uh, you know, GPT-4, it's the leading one, you know, it, it, it's not a hype. You know, based on what we know today, and uh, you know, this kind of AI can become a very useful assistant and uh, automate many tasks involving writing, reading, summarizing, follow instructions, including tasks that require some creativity and ideation. But it's important to understand what they cannot do or what they are not designed to do. You know, they have uh, unique uh, properties, some of which are not shared with humans. And, and you know, pinpointing those, I think, is important in order to, to understand what is the next step. So the, the problem with, with the language models that are trained on called this next word prediction over internet text. So this leads to some, so I would say, surprising failures when there is a conflict between next word prediction and the task and the task at hand. So, for example, there is a sensitivity to task frequency. So a rare, simple task will have less of a chance to be solved correctly than a frequent complex task. So, for example, researchers from Princeton, they showed that GPT-4 can handle the shift cipher, you know, where each letter is shifted by a fixed amount. And the popular one on the Internet is uh, 13 places. It's called uh, ROT13. When asked to shift by two places, the performance degrade, degrades noticeably. So it's the same task. Instead of shifting 13, you shift it two, and then you see a very, very uh, degraded degradation in performance. There's also sensitivity to output probability, where the answer needs to be high, high probability text. There's sensitivity to input probability. All these things are, are, are not shared with, uh, you know, with the uh, human performance. Then there's the issue of abstract uh, reasoning, the ability to form a rule from limited data. For example, researchers from University of Auckland show that GPT-4 does not perform well on abstract uh, reasoning. And I would say that in general, language models are not good at bookkeeping. 
when you when you're solving a complex uh, problem, you need to break down the problem into components, solve each component uh, separately, integrate the uh, the results. You know, lots and lots of uh, uh, you know experiments show that these language models are are not designed for for you know for a long book uh, bookkeeping. So so now the question is where are we going from here? And I think that we are witnessing the end of the first chapter of generative AI, where uh, the AI is just one large end-to-end -end network. You know, a query goes in and the final output comes out. The next phase is what I would call a decomposable AI, where AI engines would be applied to parts of the task. So you could have a super strong AI like GPT-4 dealing with the ideation step and then more specialized AI engines to perform the bookkeeping during problem solving. So uh, in order for AI to become useful as a problem solver, we'll need mechanisms to provide guarantees. So today you have no guarantee that the answer that you are getting is correct, or say the code that the AI would produce is, even if it runs, is it, uh, is it correct? Um, in order to, to do that, we'll need some guarantees. People are trying uh, all sorts of languages uh, coming from a, a theory improving called the lean to, to create a verification. There's a lot of activity in that area. And abstract reasoning is uh, something that uh, would need to be uh, would need to be solved. And I believe an end-to-end -end network is not the right tool, uh, is not the right tool for that. So we, we are at I, I believe at a very interesting juncture of, of AI. What has been developed so far is very useful. Mm -hmm. It's changing all what we know about automating, you know, automating tasks, automating cognitive tasks, writing, reading, uh, summarizing, even, you know, things that require uh, creativity. But it's it's limited. It's not going to be a, it's not going to be a great scientist. It's not going to be a great mathematician, a great physicist. We're, we're not going to have an Einstein or a Newton. Uh, uh, coming out from this uh, uh, from this generative uh, AI, and 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 that's really the next step. How do you create a great scientist um, coming out of AI? And and uh, this is something that is occupying a lot a lot of attention among the research uh, community. And I think that is uh, that is the next step. How fast are we going to proceed? I don't know. But given the, the the acceleration in the past uh, four years, I wouldn't be surprised that in the next five years, we'll have an AI that can solve you know really difficult uh, problems that the best humans cannot solve. Well, so very much uh, exciting time ahead. Uh, clearly, the, we're in the first phase. There's more coming, and uh, I really appreciate Amnan joining us tonight from Israel, and I wish you safe. And the, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you again in Israel soon. All right? Very Thank good. You Thank you, Yang. Thank you. Bye-bye.